You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. And I'm Jordan Pridgen, one of the writers here on the channel. And uh, Jordan, this episode is a fun one because normally we talk about heroes. Yeah. We talk about good guys. Mm -hmm. But this episode, it's about the bad guys. Oh, yeah. The villains. The antagonists. That's right. On this episode, we are talking about the Phyrexian Praetor Commander cards available in March of the Machine. They are all legendary creatures. They can all be your commander. They are all monocolored. They all they are almost all very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're going to break them down and let you know the cool combos and synergies we see. But first, we got to talk about our sponsors, cardkingdom.com slash command. That is the place to go to order all your magic products, singles, anything at all. March of the Machine has a ton of cool cards for commander players. There are all those team-up commanders. There are the Praetors we're going to talk about today. There's all the cards from old sets that have got cool new treatments and like showcase and stuff. Yeah, and collector's boosters. There are halo foil stuff and serialized stuff that you can't find anywhere else. Cardkingdom.com slash command is the best place to go to buy any of that stuff. Your magic players, you can to buy magic cards anyway you might as well use our affiliate link when you do so that you're supporting the content you enjoy and also card kingdom is just the best place to buy your cards because they get you stuff super fast and it all comes in one convenient package yep Pretty i nice. love card kingdom put the whole deck into the cart hit checkout and then very very soon afterwards i get one pristine package in the mail yep and of course once you get those cards you want to protect them and the game accessories brand that all of us here at the command zone trust our own collections to is ultra pro you want to put those if you open a serialized card from uh, like a collector's booster you better put that into a clip sleeve right away you might even want to buy a deck box for that one you know just yeah, give it its true. own little deck box <laughs> yeah go You're to like ultrapro.com <laughs> slash command make sure you've got all the the stuff you need to keep that serialized card mm -hmm. and all the rest of your cards safe uh, that is the best place to go to find Ultra Pro stuff. Of course, Ultra Pro also has the licensing agreements with Wizards of the Coast, so they have all the cool magic artwork on playmats, on sleeves, on deck boxes. If you really want to make your battlefield look classy and have it all match, ultrapro.com slash command is the place to go. Uh, a couple more things before we get into it. We wanted to mention that we are currently looking for freelance video editors to help us out here at the Command Zone. So if you have professional video editing experience, if you've ever you know, wanted to help us work on our projects, Projects, collaborate with us, be involved. There are links in the show notes right now. Uh, we are looking for freelance video editors. And then, of course, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You get all kinds of perks. You get to watch extra turns and game nights earlier than the general public. Also, you get to hang out on our Discord, talk with people like Jordan, myself, Rachel, Jimmy, everybody else on the crew uh, day in and day out. We also play uh, spell table games with our Discord patrons. Always so, pretty fun. Yeah. And of course, the best reason really to support us on Patreon is just because you like our content and you want to support it. We, we really appreciate do. appreciate it, yeah. Yeah, and we really do appreciate everybody that does that. Thank Absolutely. you so much. And of course, uh, the, the, the biggest perk of being a patron is we shout out one like a patron every single episode and this episode is dedicated to cricket, cricket floyd cricket you rock. rock that is a cool name cricket that's really cool that's a superhero name for sure you don't like belong it. on the villains episode i'm sorry uh all right main topic here the praetor commanders from march of the machine there are five of them the, they're the ones we all know and love but they're just yeah. in a new incarnation well and, and the cool thing about them too is that their name is all just like the right. name. There's no comma, whatever their title yeah. is, right? It's just Elish Norn, Urbrask, exactly. Children. Yeah. These are the bad guys. These are the villains. These are the ones that are not trying to save the multiverse. They are trying to take over and conquer the multiverse. Without any further ado, let's start with the first one here. It is the mama. Elish Norn. The mama from mom. If, if you don't know Elish Norn now, you, you haven't been paying attention to magic for in a like while. years. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Elish Norn is two white white. For a 3-5 legendary creature, a Phyrexian Praetor, has vigilance and says whenever a source an opponent controls deals damage to you or a permanent you control, that source's controller loses two life unless they pay one generic mana. Then she has an activated ability, which is two and a white and sacrifice three other creatures. Then you exile Elish Norn, then return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. Activate only as a sorcery. Now, all the Praetors have, are templated like this. They yeah, have, it, it's uh, the same basic model where it's like, the, the, I like also that the front side is just their name. It's right. not like Elish Norn Grand Cinnabite. It's just 
Elish Norn. Um, yeah, so they're templated in that they have a, some sort of simple keyword ability, then a, a static ability, and then they have a transform ability. And they all transform into sagas. So if you pay two and a white, sacrifice three creatures with Elish Norn, then she gets exiled and comes back as a saga, and the saga is called the Argent Etchings. Yeah, and, and the backs of all of them are like... The Praetor's philosophies that the, or, or right. the the guidances that they've brought to their... They're mostly just very much what that color does. Yeah. And so chapter one for uh, the Argent Etchings, the backside of Elish Norn, is incubate two five times. Then transform all incubator tokens you control. So incubate is a new mechanic from uh, March of the Machine, and we wrote down here, do you want to read what incubate is real quick before we move on here, Jordan? Yeah, so incubate means create an incubate token with, and in this case it's two, one one counters on it, and it has the ability to transform this artifact. Uh, it transforms into a zero zero, I believe it's Phyrexian artifact creature? Uh, Sure. It turns into a zero zero creature though, and it has the two yeah. counters that it had before. So effectively Elish Norn flips over and creates five two twos. Yep. If you had other incubate tokens, she would flip those as well. Mm -hmm. The incubate number, so it could say incubate four, that would be the number of uh plus one plus encounters that are on it. Yeah. But it always costs two to flip over. Yep. Okay. So chapter one, incubate two five times, then transform all incubator tokens you control. Chapter two of the Argent Etchings is creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain double strike until end of turn. Not bad. And especially since you've got five two twos, which are now three threes that hit for six. Yep. It, and that's if you had nothing else going on. Pretty nice. And then chapter three is destroy all other permanents except for artifacts, lands, and Phyrexians. Exile the Argent Etchings, then return it to the battlefield. Now that last part means that you'll exile... The Saga, and it will return as Elish Norn. So it doesn't even have the sacrifice clause that Sagas normally have. It just yep. flips over to the creature side of Elish Norn. Um, so destroy all other permanents except artifacts, lands, and Phyrexians. So it doesn't, I think, matter for this card whether the incubators are Phyrexians or sure, not. Sure, it hits both. Uh, well, it's, it doesn't hit both. Well, it, what I mean is that it's an artifact and a Phyrexian. So right. it... It, it does not destroy those things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It destroys everything else. So, okay. Um, and, and we should say all of the other Praetors have a same thing where they all, on their third chapter, turn back into their their creature side. Yeah. Um, they have some effect. The effects are obviously different. So, theoretically, you could flip them back and forth a couple of times over the course of a game. Yeah. Or even in the same turn, it's yeah. possible, depending on the amount of mana you've got and what else is going on. So the first thing when looking at Elish Norn um, that, I, that came to my mind is like blocking is bad. Yeah, really bad. Blocking is bad f for your opponents if you're swinging at them because if you're just swinging with a bunch of creatures, each creature they block of yours is a creature that will presumably take damage from their blocker, mm -hmm. in which case they will either have to pay one mana or take two life for all of those. Which which is a pretty steep price, especially if there's a, like a lot of blockers going on. I mean, if you think I'm going to attack you with like five one ones, let's say. Yeah. If you just let them through, you take five. If you block all five of them, you would take ten unless you want to pay some mana. <laughs> yeah. So the, like that's already kind of good. And then it's also blocking as bad as far as like if you're if the Yellow Storm player is blocking an opponent because anything that swings in at them now deals damage to the you know their controller unless they pay that mana, of course. So if you swing at me with uh, you know a couple of seven sevens or something, and I just chump block both of them yep. with my one ones, that is my creatures taking damage, and you will have to either pay mana or take damage. It really makes you think that if there's an Elish Norn on board, you're probably not going to be attacking that player unless you are going to kill them that turn. Or you've got evasion or something like sure, that. Sure, yeah. yeah you, you but, but the thing is, it's even damage to them, too. It's not just to their permanents. That's right. It's that's to them right. and their yeah. permanents. So, like, you're going to want to swing in if you have enough to kill Elish Norn, because otherwise you're just either losing a ton of mana or a ton of life. And that's, you know, can be a pretty big loss. Yeah, it's a steep price to pay. Yeah, you're probably going to... It's one mana, so I think, you, yeah. you know, if you're going to hit them for five or six, it might be worth the one mana. But, it's you know, it's going to be a lot harder to sort of peck at them for one or two damage here and there. Um, so, yeah, blocking is bad means also that go wide strategy looks like it's what's going to sort of synergize with most of her abilities. And if you look at her abilities, you want to have a lot of creatures for her static ability on her creature side. 
then for the chapter two, you really want to have a lot of creatures there as well. You want to have yep. a lot of creatures to pay those three uh, creatures you need to sacrifice to flip her over to the saga side to begin with. So it seems she seems to say, like, I would like you to have quite a few creatures on board. So it seems to be like a token go white strategy. Yeah, which I mean is not new for white. And yeah. they've gotten a bunch of great tools for it recently. Like, so, uh, I mean, like, look at White Sun's Twilight and Skrelv's Hive that were just in the last set. Both of those are just going to be making might tokens, which are, you know, also artifacts that are not going to be destroyed when that board wipe goes off at the end of the whole thing. And it's just going to fill your board with powerful things. Yeah. I think, like, um, Oketra's Monument was another one that I was looking at. It doesn't mm -hmm. make creatures that won't be destroyed by the board wipe, but it itself is an artifact which won't be killed. Yeah. Because the thing about Skrull's Hive, I think it's good, still yeah. in the deck, but it's an enchantment, so it'll get destroyed when Chapter 3 goes off of your Argent Etchings, whereas if you have an artifact, you know, like Oketra's Monument, it won't, but the creatures it makes will get destroyed. I think you're just going to have to juggle those things when well, you build this deck. And the thing the, with the mites that are made by Skrull's Hive or White Sun's... They'll live, <laughs> yeah. Well, they'll live but they also can't block and as right. we discussed blocking's good in this deck so you want to find things that can but still i think like a might is a becomes a lot more of a pain in the butt for your opponents because you just swing in with impunity and you're like normally you wouldn't just chump it in yeah chump attack i suppose would be called um but if it's like well whatever you're either going to take two damage or you know i don't if you well, block it and it dies you you're going to you know take two damage probably if well, they're tapped out mites are toxic too yeah so double strike gets really good i, I mean if you make five mites and you swing into someone who's undefended on that on double strike two. turn mm -hmm. it's done yeah you killed them uh, and then, of course, so if you're doing tokens, uh, you're going to want all the normal token cards, and White is very good at this, and only Procession, the new uh, Dominus, yeah. yeah, doubling your tokens, things like Felidar Retreat, really good here, can either make creatures or pump your board, depending on uh, where you're at in the game. I feel like the dream is to get Anointed Procession and Mondrock out, and then when it flips over to the Argent Etchings, you're just like, great, I made 20 Incubator tokens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's swing in with three, three Double Strikers next turn. Brutal. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about the Saga Synergy. Yeah. Because, and this is going, a lot of this stuff is going to be true for all the Praetors we're going to talk about because they all have a Saga side. Mm -hmm. So being able to, you know, add or remove counters to the Saga to give you control over what chapter is going to happen either now or later, um, I think it's going to be important. So the two that are going to come up a lot are the two sort of colorless ones, which are Power Conduit and Nesting Grounds. And we'll be talking about them a lot. But they're both just ways to remove a counter from your Sagas. Both mm. of them remove counters from other things, but these are mostly, we're going to talk about them in that context. And that means the ability to like, have that chapter two happen over and over again if you want to. Or maybe you want the chapter one. Maybe yep. it's like, yeah, chap it hits chapter one, you remove the counter, next turn it hits the chapter one again. You can even do things like it hits chapter two, remove the counter back to chapter one, and then maybe proliferate or add a counter to several way, get, you know, I guess double double strike's not that great, but get the plus sure. one plus one twice, those kinds of things. So, yeah, white also has another card that, can remove counters sort of of any kind. Uh -huh. Not every color does, but white has, what's this card called? Scholar of New Horizon. And uh, Scholar of New Horizon uh, just enters the battlefield with a counter on it, and then you can basically remove a counter from a permanent, and then you search your library for a planes, and you reveal it. And then if someone has more lands than you, uh, then you get to put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, it just goes into your hand. So it's also probably ramping you. Because, you know, as white, you do tend to have less lands than everyone else. So you're setting up a powerful board by getting to use whatever areas you want in the saga and moving forward. It seems like a, a pretty good fit there. Yeah, and it's only a two mana card. Uh, you do, it's a one one, but and you do have to tap it. But yeah, the, it gives white a little advantage here because mm -hmm. a lot, like I said, a lot of colors don't really have a bunch of cards that remove uh, lore counters yeah. from sagas. And then, of course, yeah, there's proliferate, uh, which we're going to talk about again with a lot of these Saga commanders um, because obviously it's a way to add the counters. It's the opposite of the power conduits and such. And Contagion Engine seems mm -hmm. like a really, really good one for most of them, but particularly, I think, for Elish Norn because you tap Contagion Engine and proliferate twice. And it's mana intensive, but that gives you the ability to add counters at instant speed. Yeah. And really have that board wipe like happen now. Yep. 
And that's a big deal because you get to control when that border happens. It could be in the middle of an attack or something like that. Well, and just think how brutal it could be if you manage to, you know, with those tokens on the board, go through the last two elements of the saga, flip Elish Norn back to the front side, and then you're able to attack with the Elish Norn life taxing going on as you attack. Yeah. Like, really, well, really tough. They won't have any creatures to block you, so won't, exactly. that part won't matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Because <laughs> their well, creatures if, if will have to destroy. Artifacts, if they have artifacts you know. or Phyrexians, yeah. Which and I, I think they're all over the place these days, so. That's the other part that's good about Contagion Engine. It's an artifact, so it yep. will not be destroyed by that Chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which makes it very powerful. Of course, there's Contagion Class, and there's other things that do it, but I think Contagion Engine feels pretty strong here. Um, you talked about, Jordan, while we were discussing, you know, off-air. Yeah. The fact that just general pillow fort strategies will stack very well with Elish Norn. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know if this is necessarily your, like, first strategy when you go with Elish Norn, but if you do, because Norn is sort of doing a Norn's Annex kind of thing on the front side of the card, but if you are playing things like Ghostly Prison and Norn's Annex, where they are charging you mana or life whenever they want to attack you, it just becomes kind of backbreaking to even send a single creature in to attack the Elish Norn player. Like, imagine that if you want to deal damage with, like, say a 2-2 two -two to Elish Norn, you have to total pay four life and a mana. Right. I don't know why you'd want to deal to Elish Norn, but yeah, if you want sure, to attack... Sure, but I'm saying to the Elish Norn player. You right, know? got it, got it. Yeah, if you want to attack with a creature, even if it's fairly yeah. large, and you're going to be like, I have to pay two to attack... And then they're going to block it. I'm going to have to pay one not to take the damage. Yep. That's a lot to ask. And that's just with a ghostly prison out. Yeah. If you stack two pillow fort effects, no one's attacking you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're just coming up with a plan for eventually being able to remove those things and kill you somehow. Mm -hmm. But it gives you a lot of time. Yeah. So I think that stuff's going to be pretty powerful. I was going to say that the good news here is the board wipe effect from uh, the saga side will take out these other pillow fort things because they're usually enchantments. Yep. So if you get a ghostly prison and an orange annex out... Probably you're not going to flip Elish Norn. Yeah, because you're probably in a pretty solid situation. Well, and also you're counting on that front side. Remember, when you flip to the Saga side, you don't get that thing anymore where if you or your permanents take damage, they have to lose life or uh -huh. pay mana. So you won't be stacking that with your Ghostly Prison anymore. So if that's your strategy, it feels like you're going to want to keep Elish Norn on the front side. Yeah. Yeah. But I will say a little bit of the good news is that like at least when that board wipe goes off on the Saga on Chapter 3, it would take out the Ghostly Prisons and the Norn's Annex. Well, Norn, yeah. Norn's Annex is an artifact. Oh, God. So. Okay. We'll take out Ghostly yeah. Prison. Yeah. I, I do think like Liquid Metal Torque, it's already a good card that we're probably playing in a lot of decks. Gets really good in this deck. Sure. Because it not only doesn't die the board wipe, it allows you to save something that's not was was going to die to that chapter three. Yeah, so if you want to save that ghostly prison and really keep up a powerful defense there. Now Liquid Metal Torque will do it. Uh, we have a couple of cool, uh, we're calling it the cool stuff category just because it didn't fit anywhere else, but you had a, a cool equipment that you found yeah. that, that would be fun with this card. So the first thing I thought of with Elish Norn's front side ability was like being able to lure and if someone has a whole bunch of creatures on their thing, get all of them to block one of your creatures and <laughs> then they have to take two life or pay one for all of them. And the only way I really found to do that was the card uh, Nemesis Mask, which is a three mana equipment and it basically just says, all creatures able to block equipped creatures do so. And it is equipped three. Not the most efficient rate right. for everything, <laughs> but boy, if you're going against a go wide deck and you can somehow manage to get all of their creatures to hit one of yours, I think it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. Or even if they've only have two or three. And sure. Then, you know, a lot of creatures have sort of value you know, tied to them, they got Orgo Maldaya yep. or something like that. They're just holding it back and they're really using it for another ability. And you go, oh yeah, well now you're going to have to block with all five of those things and that's going to either be 10 damage or you pay five mana. What do you want to do? It also strikes me as really funny, which I think is sort of the highest calling in a game of Commander, <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, I found a card I like called Flicker of Fate. Now, there are not mm. a lot of cards that will flicker in enchantments, but this one will. It's one in a white for an instant exile target creature or enchantment, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. And I like that this gives you the flexibility yeah. to save either side of Elish Norn mm -hmm. and to reset to her creature side. And you could even do that as a surprise. So you've got it on the Saga side, right? Yeah. And then they make some blocks thinking like, okay, well, at least I'm not going to have to pay life right now. And then after blocks before damage, you fl you flicker 
and Elishorn comes back on her other side, and now they're going to take a bunch of damage they didn't see coming. They, they might even be making blocks like a little aggressively because they don't expect to keep all the creatures. Yeah. When the board wipe goes off, so yeah. Or I want, I really want to block you now while you're, you know, you're not on that side. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. And you're like, boom. Oh, sorry, you actually die. You know. That's the thing that can happen. And also Flicker Flakes is just a good protection piece if they go to remove Elishnorn or yep. the Saga. So, yeah. Elishnorn, it feels like the deck will be quite good. Yeah. It feels like the deck is going to be a little bit of a pain to play against. It'll be annoying. Yeah. I mean, it's it's Pillow Fort. It's basically Wrath on a stick yep. for the whole thing. It, it's going to be strong. So, maybe what will be kind of the saving grace of playing against this deck is that it'll do a good job killing people. <laughs> um, I will say that flipping Elishnorn, you know, we kind of took it for granted, but you have to have three creatures. You have to sack them. You got to pay the mana. Um, you know, you'll have a decent chance to remove Elishnorn before it gets out of control. And a removed Elishnorn once or twice is going to be pretty hard to get off the ground. Cause, Definitely. Because it's four mana and then three to flip it. You got to have three creatures. Like, that's those aren't easy things to do. So, if you can stop it once, yeah. I, I think you're probably fine. And I mean, why does well set up to make those three creatures but it's not nothing if another person managed to get rid of your board right okay uh let's go to the next one which is the blue one it's jinga taxius oh boy excited about this one probably the most powerful of the bunch we'll see uh, you know maybe i'm just biased towards blue we know we know <laughs> that's true okay three blue blue for a five five legendary creature phyrexian praetor has ward two whenever you cast a non-creature spell with mana value three or greater draw a card and then it has its transform uh, ability which is you pay three in a blue you exile jinga taxius then return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control activate only as a sorcery we should say all these praetors say that yep. you can only do this as a sorcery you can you can't transform them at instant speed yep. and only activate it if you have seven or more cards in hand so as you had to sack three creatures for elish norn you have to have seven cards in your hand before the Jinga's Taxius to turn to its Saga side. What's the Saga side do? Well, let's see. It's the Great Synthesis, is what it's called. Chapter one, draw cards equal to the number of cards in your hand. <laughs> you have no maximum hand size for as long as you control the Great Synthesis. Now, that seems pretty good. I so, mean, it's worth noting that the number of cards in your hand is at least seven at that point. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> wow. Jinga's Taxius is, is pay four, draw seven. You, <laughs> now, you have to start with seven, but still. Yep. So you're at, at least 14 cards once chapter one resolves. G great. Awesome. S sounds I awesome. I like it. Yeah. Chapter two. Return all non-Phyrexian creatures to their owner's hands. So bounce everything. Yep. Wow. Chapter three is you may cast any number of spells from your hand without paying their mana costs. Then you exile the Great Synthesis and return it to the battlefield on the Jingataxius side. So omniscience for one instant for right now yeah r right this second all of those spells have to go on the stack at the same time because it's not you can cast those spells until end of turn it's just you can cast them without paying their mana cost right now so this bears digging into really quickly on this chapter three yeah because yeah chapter three hits it resolves yep and you cast the spells you put them on the stack so mm -hmm. you go you know i'm gonna cast Four huge things, yep. and I put them in this order, so they're going to resolve in this order. Then Jinya Taxius flips back over as part of that resolution, right? And then it won't draw you cards off the spells you cast because you already cast them, right? They're just going to resolve mm -hmm. in the order that you decided. Yep. Okay. Uh, this will ignore timing restrictions, though, because it is. Yeah. It has to happen then. So whenever the chapter three happens, and again, we can proliferate and things like that. If you have a contingent engine or whatever, sure, it is possible that on the end step before your turn, you're doing this, and whatever you're casting, they don't have to have flash or be instance. It could be sorcery speed stuff. Yeah, and also importantly, it can be creatures, which yep. is useful because you might have just bounced a bunch of non-Phyrexian creatures to your hand right before playing it. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So I think one of the first steps you're going to need, because you have to be at seven cards in hand to transform Jinga Taxius. That means you're going to need to draw a lot of cards. Yep. This is sounding awesome to me. Um, <laughs> this just wants you to play like you already do. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Just reward me for doing what I want to do. Uh, but I believe that the, the card draw you're going to mostly want to be at instant speed because 
your opponents are going to know exactly what's happening, right? Yep. So you want them to be able to miscalculate. And that's like, and then you're blue too. So they have to now worry, oh, do you have a counter spell? And then you go, no, actually, I was just sitting on a draw spell to get me up to seven so that now it goes to my turn, you know, and I uh, uh-huh. ha- I can activate Jinky Taxi. So there's stuff like um, Archmage's Charm, which is an instant for blue, blue, blue. You can choose one, counter target spell, target player draws two cards, uh, or gain control of target non-land permanent with converted mana cost one or less. You're going to draw the two cards, which will actually be three cards because of Jinja Taxi's ability. If you have four, if you have five cards in hand and this is one of them, oh yeah, this will get you to the seven. Just this card. Yeah, and, and I mean, Jin's front side ability is just going to make it so cards that were already decent card draw like that just become backbreakingly good, yeah. really solid. And I love the fact that, well, I, I don't know if I love it, but it's very strong the fact that Chapter 2 bounces everything because in normal situations, you'd be like, this is going to leave me open because I'm spending mana to draw cards and not affect the board. But I have this built-in safety valve of like, well, all the creatures are going to get bounced, so I'm not going to be in that much danger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another cool draw card that's similar is Thirst for Discovery. This is draw three cards, then discard two cards unless you discard a basic land card. So you'd basically draw four cards and discard a land. Mm-hmm. That's basically the same as Archmage's Charm, unless you don't have a land. Um, and then I really like Gush. This is like one of my favorite cards, period. Yeah. So you want to read it? Yeah. So Gush is an instant for four and a blue. And it says, you may return two islands you control to their owner's hand rather than pay Gush's mana cost. So basically, you never pay four and a blue on Gush. Um, and then it just lets you draw two cards. Yeah. Pretty simple. But with that mana cost, it also triggers Jenga Taxia. So it's drawing three cards for, you know, just bouncing islands back to your hand. Yeah, I think I like the versatility. I think you can play the five mana if what you're doing is sort of a, a, a Drago style where you're just sure. holding up open all your mana. It gets the inset before you turn. It's safe. You cast it. You draw the three cards. But sometimes during your turn or other you know, key points, you'll bounce two islands, get it for free, but it still has the same mana value, so mm-hmm. you still draw the extra card. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, cards that bounce lands like this also sometimes have the upside of like, let's say you almost have enough to flip him on the board. Yeah. I, I think you probably would, but you cast Gush, you bounce those two, you know, tapped islands back to your hand, play one of them as your land pr- for turn, tap it, that could be the mana you need to really get something going. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you also brought up the fact that like just these X instant speed draw spells and, yeah. and blue has a lot will be strong to get you to that seven mark maybe a little bit later in the game. So there's pull from tomorrow, blue sun zenith, stroke of genius. Um, these are all instant speed X spells. Not super efficient, but the thing is they can draw you, you know, 10, 12 cards. And they just let you do the thing where people don't know that you are at flip Jenga Taxis level until it's too late. Yeah. Like, you do it at the instep of the person before you, and they're like, oh, wow, he does have more than seven cards You only had two cards. I thought we were going to be fine. Yeah. 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 Okay, so you've got seven cards. You flip Jenga Taxis, and now we're building towards that omniscience moment and going up, you know, through the chapters Mm -hmm. and... The first thing that came to, I think, both of our minds were blue has a lot of cards that untap lands. Yep. And this stuff feels like it gets incredibly powerful with what is going on with the so- the front and back sides of Jenga Taxis. So let's imagine you play uh, a Palancron. Yep. Palancron is uh, five blue blue. And, and you might cast this. You might also put it into play off the Omniscience, but it is a 4-5 flyer that when it enters the battlefield, you untap up to seven lands. It also has an activated ability to boo boo to return Palangron to its owner's hand. Now, that you can often go infinite in different ways with Palancron, but the cool thing here is you play it, you untap the lands. Chapter 2 is going to bounce it back to your hand. It just and, does the bounce for you, yeah. Right. If you play it off the Omniscience... You're going to untap the lands, and Jinga Taxius is going to have flipped over to its other side, and you're going to be able to activate Jinga Taxius again to flip it back over to the Saga side and still have, you know, ostensibly three lands untapped. Yeah. And the Palancron in play that if you can somehow get your Saga back up to two is going to bounce to your hand, and then three, you're going to play it again. So you can get in loops probably where you're creating the mana to continue to flip uh, Jinga Taxi is back and forth, back and forth. Now the missing component of this, obviously you, you you use other untapping lands shenanigans, like Great Whale does it. Sure. There's Paragon Drake uh-huh. that does it. Um, there's instants and sorceries that do it. So um, 
Turnabout's a really good one. Oh yeah, very cool. This can untap, uh, you can choose the permanent type, but if you choose land, you can untap all your lands. You could also do artifacts or creatures if you wanted. Dramatic Reversal just does untaps artifacts, and everybody knows the Isochron Scepter thing, but th then you're saying, well, okay, but those are instants, Josh. Like, what do you do? Well, you get the instants back and keep casting them because there are creatures that will get instants out of your graveyard, like... Like Archaeomancer, which is uh, two and two blue, and it's just a human wizard, and when Arche Archaeomancer enters the battlefield, return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. And then the body's just a one-two, but that's not why you're playing it most of the time. If you're doing the same thing with the Palancron, where it bounces back to your hand every time you get to the second one, and then you play it again, you could get something like Turnabout that just keeps the engine rolling. Yeah, there's uh, even redundancy. Mnemonic Wall does what Archaeomancer does. There's a yep. bunch of things that do what Archaeomancer does. And so once you get that going, you're playing a Palancron off the Omniscience. You're playing your Archaeomancer off the Omniscience. It's getting the turnabout back. You're tapping all, you're untapping all your lands. You're casting turnabout. You're, you're floating the mana. You're untapping the lands. You're flipping Jin Gitaxius back over. You're, you know, it's getting kind of crazy. There's a piece missing, which we'll talk about in a second. There's well, also, yeah, go ahead. I would say even if you don't have the like next piece set up, just off of that third one, yeah. being able, because I mean, look, most of the cards in your deck are going to be drawing you cards and stuff. So ideally, after that big omniscience goes off, you have a full hand of crazy cards to do. And if you've cast that palancron, you have plenty of mana to cast everything with. Even if you don't have a way to like flip it back over and loop immediately it and, and go through the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, High Tide's another card that might fe feature in here pretty heavily because oh, it makes... Oh, yeah. It, yeah, it's a one blue instant that until end of turn, whenever a player taps an island for mana, you add an additional blue. And so think of Archaeomancer with that. Maybe you've cast High Tide multiple times in turn. And yeah, now, would... pa now Palancron's untapping seven lands or Gil or uh, Peregrine Drake is t untapping five lands that all tap for three. <laughs> It'd be great. Yeah. The, you're going to start to get in crazy situations. Frantic Search is another card that is card draw and untaps three lands. So yeah. it's doing the first part of our strategy. It's doing the second part of our strategy. I think Frantic Search ends up being one of the better cards in the deck. Yeah, you're right. I think in there, even if you're not like controlling where the chapters are at, you probably have a big enough turn that you maybe even win the game off the back of that. But then you can make this truly crazy if you once you get into the realm of proliferate and now you are able to move through the chapters of the saga at will. Uh, so let's say you have like an inexorable tide out, which is just a three blue blue enchantment whenever you cast a spell proliferate. Flux Chandler maybe is out. Two and a blue whenever you cast a non-creature spell proliferate. There's this new card. Have you played with this yet? Icar Moon Gauntlet? I have one. I, I got the fancy oil slick version nice. from the completed bundle, oh, but right. I haven't played with it in the game yet. So this is two and a blue. It has, it's an artifact. It has something to do with Planeswalkers at the top, which doesn't matter, but it says whenever you cast a non-creature <laughs> spell, choose a counter on target permanent, put an additional counter of that kind on that permanent. So it'll again work with lore counters. Um, this, now we're in the realm of like, you don't need Inner Exorbital Tide and Flux Challenger. You need one or the other, you know, or Icar Moon Gauntlet. There are a lot of, you don't need Palancron and Peregrine Drake. You need one or the other. You don't need Archaeomancer and Mnemonic Wall. You need one or the other. You might not even need Archaeomancer and Palancron. You just need one. There, There's so much redundancy for all of these pieces in the thing. And the other thing to make this really, really work is that you're going to have a massive amount of card draw. Yeah. Because so you're going to draw some of these pieces. Yeah. W when it flips over to the back, it's drawing you seven cards or more. If you flipped it a couple times, you might get to the point where it's a problem how many cards you're drawing. Yeah, it's drawing you, you know, <laughs> 30 plus cards and you're like, I'm going to deck myself. Yeah. So then you're flipping it over. You're flipping it back. You're getting through the chapters. Remember, it's bouncing the creature's and then you're replaying them for free off the omniscient side and with the uh proliferate you're able to you know control where the chapters are yep um yeah we've listed a ton of proliferate things i don't think we need to talk about all of them but like contentious plan tezzerix gambit i like clock spinning it allows you to take counters off of the oh yeah that's kind of fun and it has buyback yeah and then of course the question in all this is like okay cool so you can draw your deck you can create more or less infinite mana and this is a position that blue knows exactly what to do from here and this is the um this is the uh section we're calling draw 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 which is you know how do you win and it's probably like thassa's oracle look 
We said this was going to be the bad guy episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. How, how can we not mention Thassa's Oracle in a deck where it just is amazing? Yeah. Laboratory Maniac. Jace Wield of Mysteries. Yeah. You know them by now. Yeah. The, um, the, the chapter we're calling Draw, 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 but it should be blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that's probably like the likely way that this deck can be built to win sort of the most efficiently. You don't have to do that. You can get to the omniscient side and just cast really huge like krakens and stuff like that. That might be a, another fun sort of more Timmy way to go. Or one of the best things to be perhaps the Timmiest way to go uh, casting off of the one time omniscience is just omniscience right <laughs> that's true so, yeah yeah if you hit chapter three you could cast omniscience for free off of it and then you don't need to hit chapter three anymore and then you just get all your spells for free from then on that seems good i think you could also go the extra turns route so once you hit the omniscience part you just go you know expropriate karn's temporal sundering temporal mastery yeah it seems like you'll win that game i mean that does make you get through the saga pretty easily <laughs> that's true it's like proliferating almost it's very slow proliferate but it works uh, I was going to say, um, you know the card Seagate Restoration? Oh, yeah. I love the card Seagate Restoration. It's basically chapter one of uh, the saga side of Jinky Taxius. Mm -hmm. I'm going to admit, I was a big proponent of all the MDFCs, and I play them a lot, but I've never seen anybody cast the spell side of Seagate Restoration. Oh, I've, I've cast it a bunch of times, but... I've never but seen it anybody cast it. it's pretty rare. Yeah, I've never seen anybody cast it, so maybe I'll get to see it now, because casting it off of the omniscience part of this seems good. Yep. Um, and again, you know, usually you play it as land. Yeah, it's an MDFC, so it's very, very low price included in the deck. Yeah. Jinky Taxi seems very, very powerful. Yeah. Pro probably the most powerful one of I, these. I, I really think, and I mean, we, we've laid out all these crazy ways to make it so you can, you can keep flipping them infinitely, you can draw your whole deck and everything like that, but I, I think there's just like a ton of ways you can build it where if you get that one-time omniscious off, you win the game and you don't even really need <laughs> as many of these yeah. contingency plans and stuff. You're going to get, you know, you could just 10 be like, to 14 Old cards. Creature horror, some other big crack bam, 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 bam. tyrant. Like there's lots of huge blue things. I mean, not do Zagri, expropriate that just like pretty much win. And you're like, oh, well, any one of these is like scary enough to win. I'll just cast four of them right now. Yeah. You've got options. Yeah. Um, why does Jin Gitaxis have ward two? That was a question I wrote down. All the other ones, and we've only talked about two, but Elstron had Vigilance. One of the other ones has Menace. You know, I think Urbask has First Strike. None of those matter, but Ward 2, like, come on, if you're going to make the most powerful one, why are you making it harder for me to kill it? Josh, it's just to make him the perfect blue card. Because uh, he has to counter a spell. Someone on Reddit mentioned that Jengitaxis does everything that blue cards are supposed to do. He counters spells with ward. Yep. He draws an enormous number of cards. Yep. He does bounce mass bounce. And then he does the true goal of blue, omniscience. <laughs> yeah. Ward 2 just seems a little bit much for me. It's insane. They yeah. should have given it Island Walk or some other like non-impactful. I, I would have loved if they gave it Island Walk. It wouldn't make it, any sense. What was the, there was that um, that mechanic they tried to make evergreen, but it was like only creatures with power less than it can block. It's skulk. Oh, Skulk, yeah. yeah they should have given it Skulk. <laughs> can you imagine Jenga Taxi's just like skulking around? <laughs> All right, so yeah, this is a powerful deck and fun to talk about, can do a lot of things. I would warn people out there having, as a person who has built a number of decks that are sort of similar to this. It won't be fun to, for everybody to play over and over because it's going to do similar things every time. It It's going to be a lot of solitaire type play too where like sequencing is really important. Yeah. And you're going to really have to think and then do it right. But these decks are often not fun for the, your opponents. And often after you've done it a couple times, not that fun for you. Yeah. Just be aware. It, it is going to draw a lot of hate too. Yeah. Like I, I don't think anyone's going to look at this Jenga Taxius and assume, ah, let's let him finish it's that probably backside. Fine. It'll, it'll all go okay. You're, you're going to draw that removal on the saga, on Jenga Taxius. I mean, I'd pay the two extra to get rid of Jenga Taxius. Yeah. All right. We've got two Praetors down. There's three more to go. But before we get to those last three, let's take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. We'll be right back. Eldrazi are ravaging Zendikar! Chandra, flame caller, call forth your flames! No can do, Gideon. But 
The Eldrazi! I called my flames three times this month, and my phone bill is crazy high. Plus, inflation's burning through my bank account, so... My Pyro Paizan, you must switch to Mint Mobile. They offer premium wireless service for only 15 bucks a month. Whoa, are they having a fire sale? Not at all, my incandescent comrade. By going online only, Mint Mobile eliminates the cost of retail and passes the savings on to us. With unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network, I call my allies every day to let them know I'm still alive. And you got to keep your number and contacts? Correct, my fiery friend. Wow, in that case, I'll call my flames right now. Oh, hey, flames. Yeah, can you toast this noodly fool? Thanks. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. All right, I'm gonna cast Rampant Growth. Show Fleur. Yes, sir. Find a forest for me, please. Of course, sir. Okay, wait, what is happening here? Isn't it great? I got the idea from Indeed. The hiring website? Yeah, when you sponsor a job post on Indeed, they do all the searching for you. Just like you don't want to waste time looking through your library, you don't want to waste hours browsing multiple job sites. But with Indeed, you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed's powerful matching tool gives you a short list of candidates whose resumes match your job description the moment you sponsor a post. It's like hiring at flash speed. Plus, they've got other tools like assessments and virtual interviews to optimize the process from start to finish. Your forest, sir. Oh, thank you. Jordan, if he's making you do this against your will, you can tell us. I just like the word show fleur. Okay, you do you. Now with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that meet your hiring criteria. Visit indeed.com slash command zone to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash command zone. Again, indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Greetings, I'm Zira, the golden sting. How did I rise to the top of Hive society? I simply use Honey whenever I shop online, and not just because I'm a bee. You see, Honey finds sweet deals on things I was already going to buy. I call that a freebie. The internet is buzzing with coupons, but I cannot be bothered to find them. So I let Honey do the drone work. All I do is click apply coupons on checkout. Then Honey swarms the web for excellent deals while I'm free to live like a queen as prices drop. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. Why just yesterday I saved $5 on this lavish yellow jacket. That's money I can spend on my precious son, Beador. Hands off. Beador, language. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash command zone. That's joinhoney.com slash command zone. All right, we are back. It is the bad guys, villain, antagonist episode. We are talking <laughs> about the Phyrexian Praetors from March of the Machine. We've already discussed Elishdorn and Jingataxius. And uh, in true Wooburg order, we are going to now talk about the next one. Shieldred. Uh, one of my favorites, at least from the old uh, versions of it. Um, Shieldred is three black black for four or five legendary creature, Phyrexian Praetor. And uh, she has Menace. 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 And when Shieldred enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices a non-token creature or planeswalker. Okay, so edict on... An edict effect on everybody, um, except you. And then for four and a black, you can exile Shieldred, then return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. Activate only as a sorcery and only if an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard. Okay, so... Oh, an opponent has to. You can't yeah. even... Yeah, it's a little harder to control than your own graveyard. Obviously, when you play her, they're putting one thing in there. At least one thing's in there for hopefully one of them, you know. But then it flips over for, to the true scriptures. Um, the first point in the saga is for each opponent, destroy up to one target creature or planeswalker that player controls. So it's kind of the front side again, but you get to target it this time. Right, target or remove rather than edict. Number two is each opponent discards three cards, then mills three cards. Okay. So... That puts six things in the graveyard, although you need to have already flipped it at this point. Well, there'll be eight by that point. Sure. Yes, because you'll have edict one, destroyed another, and then they'll have discarded three and milled three. And then number three is 
Put all creature cards from all graveyards into the battlefield under your control. Exile the two true scriptures, then return it to the battlefield. So it's Rise of the Dark Realms. Yep. Is that Rise of the Dark Realms? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's Army of Dark, whatever. I always get the two mixed up. Yeah. So it's get all the creatures out of the graveyards. They're yours. Which uh, I assume the graveyards are pretty packed at this point. Well, at the very least, they had to discard three and mill three on the way to this. You destroyed something on the way to this. You edict something on the way to this. There's stuff. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's in there. So very powerful chapter three. It, it is a total of 10 mana yeah. to play it, flip it over to the back, and then you need to either wait a couple turns or find a way to proliferate and move through the thing to get to that effect. So it is not at all like, oh, wow, it's a free Rise of the Dark Realms. It's a costly thing to get to. Yeah. It is. This deck is going to do what you need to do to get there, though, because sure. it, it's a deck that's going to slow your opponents down a lot. Think of what happens here. You play Shieldred, Edict Effect. Yeah. Right? Already slowing people down. There are some decks that just have a real hard time even dealing with an edict, like a Narset deck or something like that. Decks that, like, their creature, they're only going to have one, it's their commander, and it's very important, and they're going to try and protect it with, like, Swift Food Boots mm-hmm. and stuff, and you're like, edicts get around a lot of ways that people protect their one creature. But even if you're not that type of deck, you know, it's turn four, it's turn five, sorry. Uh, you know, maybe there's a deck that's a token deck that has expendable creatures, but... I'll, it's going to be important. Like, people are going to see this. Well, well remember, it's it's a non-token edict. Oh, it's so, a non-token? Yeah. So oh, even crap. if it's a token deck, then, you know, if they have... Oh, I didn't even see that. Like, yeah. one really solid creature that's, like, producing the tokens or something like that. They'll have to get rid of it, yeah. They have to get rid of it. So, and then if when you flip it over, it immediately has pinpoint removal for each of your opponents. Mm-hmm. So destroy their best creature on each side. And then the next chapter is discard three cards for your opponents only, and mil- the mill three doesn't matter. But just think of how much s- you've slowed them down. You've gotten rid of, you know, a creature early, their best thing later, and now three cards out of their hand. Yeah. This is the kind of thing that it's not backbreaking to the point where they can't play the game, but it will narrow their options and just basically make the game take longer. And that's what you want to happen because you're just trying to get to. Rise of the Dark Realms. Well, and it does feel like if you do manage to get through even those first two saga elements, you've really, really hindered them. Yeah, big time. I yeah. mean, it, that is a f- uh, 15 for one, right? Like, you've gotten rid of five cards from each uh, opponent by the time you yeah. get to chapter two. That's pretty good. Uh, okay, but you can also, like, reuse and recur Shieldred to make this even worse. So imagine you have a sack outlet, something mm-hmm. like an Ashnod's Altar, and then you can use cards like you can basically do Black's version of Blink. Yeah, you sack Shieldred, let it go to the graveyard, and then you or or you sorry you cast one of these on Shieldred and then sack it. So yep. demonic gifts return uh, uh, to action, Malakir Rebirth. They all have different versions of you target a creature and then when that creature dies, you return it to the battlefield. Yep, and so those are ways to not only save Shieldred if they go to remove it. But also for you to be like, cool, I'm going to edict effect again. Yeah. And, and if, if you can manage to chain together edicts, like if you do three edicts in a row, even if they had a 2-2 they could get rid of and they didn't care about, a couple edicts will get there. Yeah. That, I mean, there's just so many decks where they're like, you know, edict, crap. It's uh, the only thing I got is my commander, gone. Then they're like, spend the whole next turn casting because they're like, if I don't have my commanders out, my deck doesn't do anything. And then you're like, cool. Malakir Rebirth, sack it, edict, and they're like, done, right? Like, it's yeah. almost game for them, for well, those types of decks. And, and not to mention, I mean, y- you know, it depends on the deck, but like, I- I've played, I play so many games these days where it's not like everyone has seven creatures on the yeah. board. It's like, you've got two or three really important synergistic threats that you are playing. And maybe one edict, you, st- yeah. the, 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 you know, the table's still standing, but the second one knocks the legs out, and with two legs, no table can stand. With three, it can. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a, a pretty cool thing you can do. Um, you can also, of course, use Animate Dead, Reanimate, Command the Dread Horde, and these actually allow you to bring back your opponent's stuff that they've had to sacrifice or discard. Mm-hmm. And so these have dual usage because you can use it with the Shieldred thing where you go, okay, cool, sack Shieldred, let it go to the graveyard, Animate Dead it, or you can use it aggressively like, oh, you sacked what? Yeah, I'll take that, please. Well, well, not not to mention how nice these are defensively. Like, if people are like, ooh, I don't want that thing to happen. I'm going to destroy Shaildred. You're like, 
Works for me. Cool. Reanimate dead. <laughs> New shale, Dread. Yep. <laughs> Command the Dread Horde can allow you to get a whole bunch of things back, which I really, really like. So I think that's going to be a powerful version of this is just uh-huh. using other black spells to you know have edict effects available to you but you don't have to use them always in that way and then of course you need your opponents to have eight cards in their graveyard to to even flip her so you're gonna have to be focused on milling everybody or being able to at least get one opponent down i I think getting to that first initial eight cards in the graveyard is going to be the most difficult thing about this deck it's going to be the thing that holds you up the most the biggest hurdle that you've got yeah because she gets you there if you can get her onto the backside, but you know you need it as the initial thing so Things that mill your opponents are going to be really essential to this strategy. So I think Ms. Miracor might be just the best card in the deck. Yep. Uh, it's a two-mana artifact that says whenever a permanent becomes untapped, that permanent's controller mills a card. So this just mills your opponents uh, you know, for a little bit early in the game and then more and more as the game goes on. But even three lands is going to mill them three when they untap. Mm-hmm. And then that's going to mill them four on their next turn. And by there, you'll have eight cards in their graveyard, basically. Yeah. So, and it's milling you, and it's milling all of them, and you're eventually trying to regrow all the creatures out of the graveyard. So this is just good for you all around. Uh, I think uh, Altar of Dementia is your, your really nemesis good. card in yeah. many ways. <laughs> and this, you know, because we want sack outlets, and we mentioned Ashnod's Altar earlier, but it could just as easily easily be Altar of Dementia that you're using with Malakir Rebirth, and now you're milling the player that's going to allow you to flip her. So you're like, Shieldred comes in, you everybody sacks something, Altar of Dementia, sack it, you mill bring her back, you sack something, and now there's like six cards in the graveyard already. Well, an Altar of Dimension is also great once you've flipped it and everything because, you know, it's already filled the graveyards a little bit, but when you're getting to the point where everything is about to come back onto the battlefield, you don't want any creatures just sitting right. on the battlefield that you already have. You probably can sacrifice all of your creatures to Altar of Dementia, flip more cards into your opponent's graveyards, really fill it up, everything is going to come back. Yeah, so chapter three goes on the stack. You sack your whole board, yep. mill some a lot and then bring all that stuff back and you might be able to just kill people just by sacking the creatures you just got which Absolutely. is good because they're not gonna have haste mm-hmm. uh, sir conrad's another one that can mill everybody and also de- deals damage as they're milling and discarding and things like that yep um and then of course removing counters from your sagas is going to be particularly brutal on chapter one or two of this one because you're either going to pinpoint removal everybody mm-hmm. or you're going to make them all discard three and mill three Point. again. If you can get that discard three, mill three off twice, I mean, that's game. Yeah, let's like, imagine <laughs> like somewhere around turn six or so you are able to go, cool, chapter two hits, everybody discard three. They're like, Ugh, yeah. I'm down to four cards. Cool. Take a uh, the counter off it, somehow proliferate one back on, everybody discard three again. That's probably, you're right. A lot of decks are hellbound now. They, they are not doing anything. They're just drawing off the top of their deck and you're in a good position to win. Now, they're not going to like that happening to them, but it, that's sure, powerful. Yeah, I mean, now, if that was happening to me, the one card I would keep in hand is whatever I can do to stop uh, sure, but things can go off a full in the last hands. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, cool, Shielder dies, I guess, but oh. I have a full hand. <laughs> what do you guys got? Nothing. Yeah. And then Black has cards like Hex Parasite and Thrall Parasite. They're pretty similar, so I'll, I'm just going to read Thrall Parasite. It's one black for a 1 1, has extort, but it says tap it and pay two life, remove a counter from target non land permanent. So it's very similar to Nesting Grounds Power Conduit and how you're going to use it uh, and just be able to sort of keep the the lore counters down if that's what you want to do. And 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 having that chapter three go off early, the, the Rise of the Dark Realms, is not going to be very advantageous. You need to make sure that that doesn't happen until you want it to. So yeah. these cards are going to be very power, or powerful and very important to your strategy. And I think, you know, black is the best tutor color, so you will be able to find these cards and, you know... Well, and all the graveyard tutors play pretty well in this deck too, so black's got a lot of what it needs. Yeah, I just mean, like, if you got Vampiric... Tutor, Demonic Tutor, maybe another Tutor, and then Power Conduit, Nesting Grounds, and Throw Parasite. You have virtually six cards in your deck that are that. That's more than any yeah. other color yeah, that make it happen. Sure. To like take remove counters. But then of course, uh, I'm calling the next category Army of the Dread, Shale Dread. Uh, you want to get to Chapter Three. And you want to get to chapter three because it's probably your win con in this deck. Uh, so you have to make sure that you do get there. Uh-huh. And the best way to do that is not taking away counters. It's adding counters. So let's talk about proliferate here a little bit because black actually has some decent pieces. Black's, black's a solid proliferate color. Yeah. Maybe not as good as blue, but sure. But they're pretty good at it. Um, so there's Drown in Icker, which is a 
removal spell at sorcery speed, target creature gets negative four, negative four, and then you proliferate. It's kind of doing double duty here because yep. it's putting something into the graveyard that you're going to be able to get back and then is moving you along the path. Like if you just flipped it and you got to destroy that and that and that, and then you play Drown a Nicker and destroy something and it goes to the next one. Everyone discard three cards. Everyone three discard cards. three cards. So you basically killed the best four creatures on the board. Yeah. And then... Everybody discard three cards. All your opponents yeah. discard. That's brutal. Yep. Uh, Yawgmoth, Thrawn Physician. Always also really has, good. Yep. Also has Proliferate on it. And then, of course, there's things like Contagion Engine, Contagion Class. We haven't mentioned Karn's Bastion yet, but it probably goes in all these decks. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think, though, you really want an instant speed Proliferate. Yeah. You you, you pointed these out when we were talking about it earlier, and it, it's, it seems fun and tricky. Yeah. Now, Contagion Engine, Contagion Class, Karn's Bastion, they can proliferate at instant speed, but your opponent can see those on board. So yeah. they are calculating into. Maybe they can't stop it and it's going to happen anyway, but they probably know it's going to happen. They're going to see Contagion Engine, see the mana, and be like, yo, they can activate that and get Rise of the Dark Realms at instant speed mm -hmm. at any time they want. We should probably pay attention. But there are a few instant speed cards that, have, that, are, that uh, are instants that are in your hand that they won't see coming, and I think that's really powerful. So these two cards are not individually great, yeah. but I think you probably still play them in this deck for the surprise factor. And one of the things I mentioned, too, was um, you really want, when you Rise of the Dark Realms here, when you bring back everything... You want to use it right away, because if you go, cool, get everything out of everybody's graveyard, my battlefield is crazy, past turn, yeah. good chance you don't have that stuff when it comes back. So if you could do it on the turn of the person before you on their instep, it's going to be much, much stronger. Yeah, it's like having haste. So again, another reason why you want instant speed. So Grim Affliction and Whisper of the Dross, I think, are both very good. These are basically the same card, except that Whisper of the Dross costs only one mana, and Grim Affliction costs uh, two and a black. Yeah, but they're both <laughs> instants that give a negative one, negative one to a creature and proliferate. One gives a counter, right? And one doesn't. That's the difference. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it's the proliferate you're really going for here. And just to get that surprise factor of like, oh, you thought you had one more turn before this happens. It's happening now. And hey, if they have a 1-1, one, one, you get to sure, kill it. Sure. <laughs> you know what? And then get it back for yourself on yeah, your side. It's exciting. It's a token. Yeah. Let's talk about that, um, that haste problem that I was just talking about, too. Yeah. So the, I, I think... Black is bad at haste, right? Mm -hmm. the, it might be the worst color. No, it's not, but it's one of... It's, it's pretty down there. I think blue might be worse, but black ain't good at it. Yeah, and you don't really have a black card that gives creatures haste. A few of them have haste, but mm -hmm. like... So you're down to like a Chroma's Memorial as a haste giver, yeah. which is not a great one because it's seven mana, uh, but it does give haste. And I think if you have an Ashnod's Altar, a Phyrexian Altar, and Chapter 3 goes on the stack, if you can sack everything to that to get the mana to... Okay, all the creatures come back. Now I cast a Chroma's Memorial with the mana that I was floating. Sure. That is a real play pattern that could exist. Uh -huh. But a, Chroma, a Chroma's Memorial, I found to be pretty bad, stuck in your hand in most places. And you usually cut it from decks because most it's, of the time it's bad. It's a tough card to include unless you have some way to cheat on its mana. Yeah. Uh, but then there's Crashing Drawbridge. Yeah, this is kind of neat. This card, Crashing Drawbridge, is just a two-mana artifact creature wall with Defender, and it can tap, and it just says, creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. If you're not playing Crashing Drawbridge, you should consider it. It goes in a lot of decks. It's an 0-4 as well, so it's an early blocker, and it gives all of the, your creatures haste, not Easy just Easy card one. to underestimate. Yeah. It is the type of card that matters a lot later game, does still matter early game, is um, sort of a low-cost point to put in your deck. Now, the thing is, if Crashing Drawbridge is one of your creatures, it would have to not have summoning sickness, which means yes. it can't come have come back from the graveyard this turn. But of course, there are good cards that give haste to one creature, like Swiftfoot Boots and Lightning Roots, that probably belong in your deck. So I think there are probably play patterns where like Crashing Drawbridge is in the graveyard, Chapter 3 goes off, People are like, it's okay, I'll board wipe or whatever. Mm -hmm. You get everything back, and then you go, cool, play Lightning Gears attached to my cr Crashing Drawbridge, which just came back because of Chapter 3, and yep. now I'll tap it and attack and win. Yeah. That seems cool. Seems very good. All right. You mentioned, and we have mentioned, how this is the episode about yeah. the bad guys. So we got to tell you the bad guy things you can do. Yeah, so I think <laughs> there's probably some classic combos that belong in this deck if you're doing this sort of mean version of it. And I don't know that there's a non-mean version of this deck, right? It's going to make your opponent sack creatures. It's going to make them discard cards. The Edict right away should tell you that it's a bad guy deck. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a lot. There are some cards that go in well with this um, 
with this mill strategy and that are going to mill your opponents but are also part of combos. So there's a classic Blood Chief Ascension plus Mind Crank, which will basically mill um, everybody out when they lose life. Yeah, they start to lose life, and then one of them makes them lose life when they mill cards, and then the other one makes them mill cards, mill cards when they lose life, yep. and that just works out. <laughs> yep, so that's something you consider. There's also Painter Servant and Grindstone, which will get one player... Uh, because it turns all cards that are everywhere, decks and everything, into a color of your choice. And then Grindstone mills them and repeats the process if the cards they milled were the same color. And so Painter Servant got unbanned a few years ago. And this this combo is fine. Like, it's going to take yeah. out one player. But I just wanted to mention it because you Grindstone is a card that you would put in this deck anyway. And so just adding the Painter Servant is pretty low cost point. And Mind Crank and Blood Chief Ascension both work regardless of having the other piece of the combo out for yep. your deck's trade. They're already part of the plan. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think this deck is going to be quite good, hard to play against, uh, frustrating, and it's it's the type of deck that's going to be like, what does this deck have? Board wipes? Removal? Yeah. And mill. And it's not even really creature-focused itself. It's going to say, well, then how do you win? If all you do is kill everything, how do you win? Oh, I use my opponent's graveyards eventually and kill them with that. Yeah. I, I think it's cool. I, I, I think I'm I'm a little less high on this one than I am on uh, either of the ones before it a bit because it's a powerful effect. But like the way I also kind of think about it is, is all the stages of this, there are cards that do that. And I don't necessarily play all of those cards like in a lot of things. I think having them all together is really going to like up the power level of the whole thing, but it is a big cost and it's going to be tough to like get it going at the beginning. Those games where you get your, you know, mesmeric orb out on turn two are going to play really, really strong in this. But I think you're going to draw a lot of hate. And so you it's probably difficult. Will. Yeah. But if you can pull it off, it's going to be a big, splashy reanimation play. The one thing I'll say is the other two decks, nothing on their commanders really stops your opponents from executing their game plan. Yeah. Um, this one does, right? Kills a lot of stuff. That's true. Discards yeah. a lot of things. And I think th that is hard to measure when you're sort of in theory craft mode, but that will end up being as or more powerful in a lot of situations. It's why a lot of, you know, players are like, play more removal because you find when you yeah. do play more removal that you win more and it's not, it's because stopping people is important. Yep. Um, yeah, but this will be. You know, this is not going to quite be Turgrid, but it's it's not going to be super fun. To play it, it, it's also going to be a deck where you sit down and they cast Shadow and you go, "I have to deal with them." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are a problem already. <laughs> Can right. you deal with them? I guess we'll find out. <laughs> All right, the next one is the red one. It's Urabrask. Two red red for a 4-4 four, four, legendary creature Phyrexian Praetor. Has first strike and says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Urabrask deals one damage to target opponent. Add red mana to your mana pool. Um, so Echoes of Bergy here. Yeah. It's transformability just costs a red. You pay a red, you ex exile Urabrask, then return to the battlefield transformed on its saga side under its owner's control. Activate only as a sorcery and only if you've cast three or more instant and or sorcery spells this turn. So very clearly a spells matter deck. We've seen a lot of these. Well, and I, it, it's price. It, it's basically free because if you cast three instants or sorceries, the third this one turn, gives you the red. The third one is giving you a red and you can just spend it on flipping it. Yep. Uh, the saga side is the great work. Chapter one, the great work deals three damage to target opponent and each creature they control. Chapter two, create three treasure tokens. And chapter three, until end of turn, you may cast instant and sorcery spells from any graveyard. If a spell cast this this way would be put into a graveyard, exile it instead. Then you exile the great work and uh, flip it back over to the Urabrast side. So yeah, we mentioned Bergy, who's a known quantity. It's actually kind of Bergy, but quite a bit better. Oh yeah, Bergy plus. Because <laughs> even if you take the Saga away, which is also a plus, yeah. but even just the fact that it deals one damage to target opponent when you're casting these instances of sorceries. That's the piece of the puzzle that Bergy doesn't have and yeah. is always looking for, right? This, this is starting out one step along the game path of Bergy. It's, yeah, it's, I think Rachel said, this is kind of wild. It is kind yeah. of wild. That's not a thing I would have wanted to add to Bergy. I would like you to have to assemble the damage dealing part of the equation. Urbras comes with it stapled on. Yeah, so it's Storm dot deck. Yeah. And honestly... I don't believe this deck looks very different than a Bergy deck. It probably looks almost identical. I, I can't really imagine any cards being 
in a Bergy deck that you wouldn't want in this. Right. There might be a couple that are specific here, but I, my guess is you're in the five to eight different cards than a, a, a good Bergy deck. I do think some cards get better when you consider that you are going to very, very consistently have that damage on the front side of the whole thing, but you could probably switch this out for Berg, for Bergy in an existing Bergy deck, and it's going to play very well. And probably just be better. Bergy yeah. does have that other side, which sure. sometimes comes up, but very, very rarely. So you... You're going to play a lot of cheap cantrips. These are one mana spells, instants and sorceries that replace themselves um, because they basically increase your spell count at the at the loss of no resources because yep. if they cost a red to cast, you're getting the red back from Urbas, you're getting one damage on somebody, and if they draw you a card, you're just totally even on that exchange. So red has a ton of them. Yeah, I, I, and I really think if it's, if it's one red mana to cast a spell and it says draw a card you on the card, it. you put it in the deck. Yeah. So we're not going to name them all, but they're Expedite, Renegade Tactics. Crash Through, Warlord's Fury. Crimson Wisp. I like Crimson Wisp because it's so... Old school. Yeah, it's yeah. old school and it doesn't do a whole lot. It just turns something red. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Oh, it gives it haste. Yeah, sure. That's cool. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of these. There's a, there's a million bajillion of those. If you saw my Tor Walkie deck that I played on Game Nights mm -hmm. um, a while back, it's very similar to that that idea that strategy that deck had black as well but it's doing the same thing uh then of course you'll find when you cast a lot of cantrips so you're basically like casting a card but staying mana neutral and drawing another card to replace it you'll end up with a bunch of lands in your hand eventually because yep. the lands you can't cast so you, you don't turn through them and so the great thing is red has all these cards that are basically uh, rummaging or looting cards, mm -hmm. faithless looting, thrill of possibility. These there's a bunch like this that are just like, oh, cool. As a cost to cast this, discard a card and now draw two more. Well, and, and they're particularly good in this deck too because if you do end up taking it onto the backside and going down and playing everything from the graveyard, you want things that you know let you discard cards and get more into your graveyard and stuff. And then of course there's cards that are based on uh, impact or sorry, impulsive draw. Mm -hmm. So there's like light up the stage. Um, which is going to be really, really good because the one damage from, from I almost said Bergy, from Urbrask is yeah. going to... <laughs> Very easy to... It, it just triggers itself, right? Yeah, that's the spec... So the spectacle, well, yeah, it won't. You need, you, to, yeah. you need to have done it before, but it's still very, very, very easy to get that spectacle off. Right. It's exile the top two cards of your library you, until end of uh, your next turn. You may play those cards. It's three mana unless your opponent has taken damage and opponent has taken damage. Then it's one red mana. So cards like that become very well because, or very well, become very good because <laughs> you cast one spell, target an opponent, they've now taken damage and now live the stage. Uh, is turned on for its spectacle. Uh -huh. Just Jessica's will is going to be insane in this deck. Oh, we finally made Jessica's will yeah. good. Yeah. So uh, you found a, actually a really cool card. I think this one sounds really fun. It, it kind of makes it, it, it feels almost like it could be like a big high tide style turn yes. in this one. But th um, that's how this deck's going to play. You're going to save up, try and just get the pieces in place and then have one big explosive go, Bam, 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 bam. Yep. But this card is called Bonus Round and it is one and two red and is a sorcery, and it says, until end of turn, whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, that player copies it and may choose new targets for the copy. So if you're going to be casting 50 spells in a turn, you can get 100 of them instead. And all that draw one means draw two, right? Yeah. Uh, now, light, light up the stage is uh, impulsive draw two twice, so now, four, look at four cards. They are copies, yeah. so each of those copies is not going to be giving you an extra mana and dealing the extra damage from Urbrask, but you are going to be getting the effects of these cards twice, which is going to be worth it. Yeah, what you find is that it's the card part that holds you up the most when you have something like Urbrask or Burger because yep. you're getting the mana back. But what you'll do is run out of things to cast. Mm -hmm. And you'll be like, oh, man, I need to draw a one-man cantrip to keep going here. Otherwise, I have to stop because what I've got is lands and, you know, yeah. and creatures or whatever. Yeah, bonus round seems really sweet. Uh, of course, the next step of this process is storm triggers, which is stuff that's going to tr can also trigger off the instants and sorcerers you cast. So anything that, um, you know, says do something when you cast an instant or sorcery is going to be in the running. Of course, Bergy goes in this deck. Yeah, put Bergy in this Bergy Plus deck, right? <laughs> so now when you cast uh, an instant or sorcery, you'll get two red mana. So now you're casting Crimson Wisps and drawing a card and you're up a mana. Yeah, if Crimson Wisps just read, add two draw red. a card, add two red, you'd be like, oh. And this do one damage busted. to an opponent. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally broken. Uh, Storm Kiln Artist is in the same vein because every time you cast uh, an instant or sorcery spell or copy an instant or sorcery, um, it makes a treasure. So I that's mean, the thing that's so nice about Storm Kiln Artist is 
if if you do start doing your whole thing and you're like, oh, I can't actually kill them this turn, you get to keep all those treasures. Yeah. Or if you get it out early enough, you usually won't play it till the turn you're going off because they will kill it. And That's true. Because if you let a storm kill an artist, like last rotation of the table, you are you are going to lose 100. percent Yep. But you could, you know, maybe play it lightning bolt a thing, just keep things under control, and then get back to your turn, have two or three extra mana to, on the turn you're going off. A uh, runaway steam can steam can is in the same category where it slowly gets one one counters, and then you remove the counters to add three red mana, and and then you use that three mana cast more spells to add more counters to it to remove counters to get more mana to cast more spells to remove counters to get more mana to cast more spells. Steam can. It only costs two mana, so it's actually, I think, the best of these three because it's so easy to sandbag it in your hand, and it doesn't hold you back that much of the turn you go off to add the two. It's a lot harder to add four for Stormkiller well, or three for Bergy. And you do need to get it up to three before you get anything back from it, but this deck's not going to have any trouble doing that. If you weren't going to cast three spells, then yeah. you weren't going to go off that turn anyway, so you shouldn't be playing Runaway Stinkin' yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then, how do you win? Well, there's a bunch of damage-dealing... You know, to your opponents when you cast spells, cards. Gutter Snipe is the marquee one. Deals two to each opponent when you cast an instant or sorcery. Yeah, just things to make that effect on the front side of Urbrask uh, a little more, have a little more punch to it and work a little faster. Yeah, Urbrask does one damage to one opponent when you cast an instant or sorcery, which is going to take a while to get there. You have to cast 120 things if they're all at 40. Gutter Snipe does two to each. So now you only have to cast 20 things total, and a lot less, actually, because the Urbrask damage is still happening. Yep. Um, then there's Kessid Flame Breather, Firebrand Archer. There's a bunch in this category as well, and you probably won't even want to play all of them. In Bergy, I think you kind of did, but because Urgrass has damage on it, you Yeah, you've already got one handled. Yeah, but still, you're going to play some amount of them, and you can think of Kessid Flame Breather as a damage doubler, but it only costs two, manage, two uh-huh. mana for Urbrask. It's actually a little bit better than that, but yeah. And then... Um, of course, so oh, I gotta go to the next page here. Yep. Red is not good at proliferating at all. As black is not good at haste, red is not good at proliferating. In fact, I, I my name for the category is no liferate. <laughs> no liferate. Yeah, nice. Not, I, not technically true. They have a little. Yeah, yeah, but all the proliferate that they got was from the last set that came out. Yeah, they were like it's everybody all gets from a little. One. They're like, <laughs> fine, give them some proliferate. Everybody gets a little. <laughs> so there's volt charge, which is two in red for an instant. It deals three and then proliferates. And there's Cacophony Scamp, which is a one mana one one. When it deals combat damage to a player, you can sacrifice it and then you'll proliferate. I don't yeah. actually know if you even play either of these cards. I kind of think you probably don't because I mean you're not even going to be able like it, when you want to do the proliferate to be going through the saga. You're not even on the side where you want to be like casting Volt Charges and doing a little extra damage. To that's really else. interesting. Yeah, that's true. So you're probably still in the realm of Karn's Bastion. It's tough and yeah. Contagion Engine Clasp and Staff of Completion. That kind of stuff i actually like what you said there because it's easy to forget when you flip to the saga side you don't get the mana and the damage when you cast instants and sorcerers anymore and that's a big deal your deck will be built around that so i think of all the praetors yeah this one you most of the time will not want to flip if you're flipping it it means you're in trouble yeah you're playing it on the front for that effect that being said one thing i also do think makes this a little stronger than like a bergy sort of thing is you do have the option of flipping it. Flipping it on the back isn't great, but beca- isn't super great because it does mean you're gonna have to take a couple turns, like going through that probably. But because you're really trying to get to chapter three. I mean, if the way that these sort of mono red storm decks fizzle out is when you run out of cards and you didn't have enough to deal with everybody, and something happened like that, and that does eventually, like that third thing. Even though I wouldn't say it's on the same power level as the other Praetors that we've already talked about, if you have a graveyard loaded with all those instants and sorceries, it flips back to the front side and you just go bam, 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 and maybe that's the turn that you kill them on. Yeah, it does give you a sort of reload to try and go off again, because if you go off and you get stopped in some way, it can often be game over for these decks because they have such a hard time sort of loading up again to try and go off again. But yeah, the the third chapter on the Saga side does give you a shot at it. And remember... On that third chapter on the saga side, you can also cast instants and sorceries from your opponent's graveyards. So you might be able to do things that you couldn't even have done with the cards you drew this game and played already, which didn't obviously kill everybody yet. Um, so yeah, I think that saga side is going to be a safety valve it's, of a like it's break a in case cord of instead of yeah. being plan A like it is on the other. And it's going to be slow, so it's unlikely to still work, but <laughs> yeah. at least it's something. It's better than not. Um, there's one thing I wanted to talk about before we go on, because having built a Torwaki deck and played against Bergy and things... 
There are some trap cards, I believe, to watch out for that a lot of people tend to put in these decks that I don't think... I'm not saying putting zero of these in, but you don't want very many. Yeah. Maybe maybe one or two max. Um, maybe not even two. Uh, and these are the damage doublers or damage triplers, the damage multipliers, the force multipliers. There's a lot of names I came up with it. But anyway, they're the stuff that says, like, if a red source would deal damage, it deals twice as much or plus two or three times as much. So Torbran, the new Dominus from Red, Solfim, Fiery Emancipation, Patien... Uh, mechanized warfare, city on fire. Sorry, a lot of these sorry, are like editors. double it. Yeah, sorry, editors. They're putting a lot of cards on screen. <laughs> Ember Mar Hellion. I'll just keep going after I apologize. Uh, there's a lot of these, and if you look at the mana cost of these, they're four, five, six, eight. A which, ton of mana, which is probably going to be the top end of your curve on this deck. Yeah, and I don't think you're going to be wanting to cast a non-instant or sorcery at that size, p- pretty much at all. You're just so much better off going Kessig Flame Breather. Which does yep. double the damage kind of from Urbask. I mean, it's more than double, but like those are going to be more efficient. That costs two mana. And the way these decks work is you're very tight on the turn. You're very tight for mana on the turn where you actually go off. And so you can't afford, like you're looking at a fire emancipation going, well, if I pay six for that, I got two mana left and I can't do it. But if I pay two for Kessage Flame Breather and then I pay two for Runaway Steamkin, and then I go, or I, sorry, Steamkin, then Flame Breather, yeah. and then I go Crimson Wisp Expedite, I get the mana from Runaway Steamkin, and now I'm going. That's a totally different world that you could never pull off with Fire Emancipation, yeah. I do have to say, with all of these, I, I like Torbran more than a lot of the other ones, because a lot of these are just kind of like big do-nothing enchantments on their front side. The at least the nice thing about Torbran is it adds two to the damage that's going on, yeah. so it's a really efficient increase in what you're getting off of the Urbrask. Like, if, if you're doubling the one damage he does, that's not worth it to have played, you know, one of these big yeah. uh, enchantments off of. But at least Torbran... Says it's a pretty nice, yeah, for all intents and purposes, it's tripling it but at the beginning. But Kessig Flame Breather actually triples it as well. Yeah. Actually, quadruple. Uh, well, instead of doing one, it deals four. Sure, yeah. So, and it's only two mana versus four. Yeah, I, I'm just saying, it's be still, careful. Yeah. yeah. There's still not the most efficient way to do it, but Torbrand seems pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I'd say maybe you have one of those in the deck, maybe two, but don't go, don't go ham with those. So, yeah. Okay. I think this deck's going to be strong. We know the Burgi deck is strong, and this is likely to be a little bit stronger. Yeah, I, I think this and Jingataxius are sort of decks that I really want to see go off once. I want to see them do their thing yeah. once and be like, whoa, you played your whole deck yeah. and, and cool. killed everybody in one big string of spells. Yeah, awesome. Now, every time you pull out that deck after I've seen it do that, I'm going to be like, uh, <laughs> I've already seen oh, it. Oh, no. I've already seen it. All right, we got one more Praetor left to go. Last but not least. It is. Or maybe least. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. It's the mono green one. It's Vorn Clex. Three green green for a 6 6 legendary creature. Phyrexian Praetor has trample and reach. When Vorn Clex enters the battlefield, search your library for up to two forest cards, reveal them, then put them into your hand, That's then shuffle. Any sort of forest. Doesn't have to be a basic forest. Yeah, but it goes to your hand, not onto the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, and then the transform ability is six green green, so eight mana. You exile Vorn Clex, then return it to the battlefield, transformed under its owner's control, activate only as a sorcery. Vorn Clex is the only Praetor that doesn't have some other... Um, uh, what's the word? Some other associated associated cost. cost. With, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think they were like foreign class just cost more mana. Yeah, that's the associated cost. You Extra just mana. got a ramp. Yeah, so eight mana to flip it to Saga Side, which is the Grand Evolution Chapter One. Mill ten cards. Put up to two creature cards from among the milled cards onto the battlefield. So you can't. It can't just be things that were already in your graveyard. Has to be among the milled cards. Yeah. Still mill 10. Uh, Chapter 2 is distribute 7 plus 1 counters among any number of target creatures you control. And then Chapter 3 is until end of turn, creatures you control gain pay 1. This creature fights target creature you don't control. And then you exile uh, this the Grand Evolution and flip it back over to the Vorinclex side. So it... For... Eight mana after paying five mana. So 13. Play him. So 13 mana total. You get to mill 10 cards and get two creatures out of it. Oh, you do draw two forests. Or you, oh, you yeah. tutor two forests. You get two forests, right. Yeah. 13 mana, tutor two forests to your hand, and then mill 10 cards and... And a little extra power on the board. And then you can sort of selectively board wipe. 
if you pay more mana because you can just take all your creatures that you've got out and pay to have them fight oh, yeah. everything going down on the, the other th thing. Yeah, going if down the chapters, the you get thing. seven more counters and then you, yeah. Yeah. Then you do the fight thing. Yeah, it's uh, none of the modes really wow you. I think you you do some math here, Jordan. Yeah, so some of the odds here. I, I messed around with some hyper geometric calculator stuff. And what, what I found is that um, if you have 30 creatures in the deck, and this is a little off because you'll, you know, have played through. Depends on what card in the is, deck yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff. But in general, you'll have about an 87% chance to hit two creatures when you mill 10, like in those 10 that you mill, um, which sounds pretty high. But I do have to say that 13% happens a lot. Like if you build a deck in such a way where you're like, well, it fails six, 13% of the time. It happens pretty seven, often. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Now with 35 creatures, you get to 92% in those 10. But I will say right now that I realized as soon as I did those numbers that I'm slightly off. It's the odds are slightly better than that because he does remove two forests from the deck. Ah, uh, yes. Well, and it would <laughs> depend on what turn you are or what else has happened. Like it's yes. going to be different on turn 12 than turn, you know five or something i don't sure. know how you get to 13 man by turn five but yeah but it'll uh, stay kind of similar because like the the percentages of the cards in the deck are generally going to remain the same but it is nice that when you remove those forests from the deck those are two things you can't flip that are creatures when you mail them so gotcha. it's it's nice i mean the thing that's easy to not even think about is that that's just the odds of hitting two creatures yeah you don't. They're, you're gonna have some like wood elves or whatever in your deck. Doesn't right? mean they're the creatures you want to hit. If a land of war elves is one of those, you're like, Ugh. I paid 13 mana and I got a little Sakura tribe elder and a land of war elves. That's not what you want to happen. So mm -hmm. it's not like you have 30 creatures in your deck that are eight CMC plus. Yeah, I mean, this is leaving me to think like you can't leave it up to chance or luck. You're gonna have to have top deck manipulation. You're gonna yep. have to know something good is in those 10 cards to even be worth the eight mana you're about to spend to mill it. So scroll rack. Mm -hmm. Sylvan Library. Finally, Sen Sylvan Library is good enough. Yeah. Again. <laughs> Sensei's Divining Top. These are things that allow you to either seed things there or at least look and be like, oh, cool, there's something good there. It's yeah. worth it this turn for me to do that. Maybe. And green has a lot of things that let you look at the top card of your deck and like know what's there for that sort of thing. Right. I mean, I like Scroll Rack because you can put things there. So yeah. anything in your hand. I like Sylvan Library because there'll be multiple cards. Maybe you see, oh, there's two here that I like. I'm not going to draw them. I'm going to put them there so I know they act. I, I, I can activate. Sensei's Divining Top, same thing. But yeah. Yeah, green actually has like future sight stuff. Mm -hmm. Usually it's like, look at top card of your library. If it's, a, if land, it's a land, play it. Or if it's a creature, play it. In this case, you can at least just look and be like, cool. When I activate, I'm not going to just whiff. So there's Corsair of Crufix. Vizier of the Menagerie. That's a cool one. I like yep. this one. Cream of the Crop. So it's two mana for an enchantment. Whenever a creature comes into play under your control, you may look at the top X cards of your library where X is that creature's power. If you do, put one of those cards on top of the library and the rest on the bottom of any order. So if you... Oh, that's pretty spicy for yeah, this Yes, so you actually get a decent amount of selection. So yeah. you have a good chance to play a creature and then put something good there that you know. Uh, and then... The fun part of all of this, obviously, is like, what are the cool big creatures you have that you are cheating into the battlefield? Uh, I was going to say for free, but it costs you eight mana. Yeah. And luckily, this is the part where green excels, right? There's really big, really cool stuff. Nyx Bloom Ancient. Nyx Bloom Ancient, one of my favorite cards in Magic, Ooh, period. Yeah. yeah. If you get that out and you cheated it out and you still have some lands untapped afterwards, you are going to be able to do whatever you want. Yeah. There's like old Gnawbone, mm. a, a somewhat new favorite. Uh, Vigor is really good, as we'll talk about later. It really synergizes with that chapter three. Um, we wanted to talk also about the Eldrazi Titans here because those are other things you can put in. Well, and, and, and Vigor also has kind of the same sort of thing. It's sort of interesting. Yeah. Uh, clarify that the Eldrazi Titans that shuffle your graveyard back into your deck do work with this because the milling and the reanimating is all one ability. So what will happen, like, if, if you ha play Kozilek or Ulamog and they are in those 10 cards you mill... Mm -hmm you are going to get the shuffle your graveyard into your library trigger, but you can reanimate them first. Right. Sorry, these are the original Adorza Titan. Yeah. Ulamog, the Infinite Gyre, and Kozilek. What's the OG Kozilek called? Whatever. Um, From the original um, uh, Rise of the Eldrazi set, those ones have this shuffle clause where you shuffle your graveyard into your library if they ever hit the graveyard. Yes. Yeah, you get to animate them. Is it really animate them? Whatever. You get yeah. to bring them back with Vorin Klex, and then the shuffle would happen, but they're not there anymore, so they're yeah. on the battlefield. Yeah. Which could be nice, like, if if you are finding a way to, like, keep doing the whole thing and you don't want to end up milling out, maybe having, like, these in your deck to put everything back into your graveyard is a solid move. 
Yeah, it's a way to sort of make sure you don't uh, deck yourself. Maybe mm-hmm. you need that in Jenga Taxis too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, you won't get the cast triggers off of those when you do it this way, but the original Titans have Annihilator, and so they are good to just have. And then you probably still play these. Well, Emrakul is an interesting one. Emrakul, the promised end, because it costs 13, but you reduce it by the card types in your graveyard. And because you're milling things into your graveyard at a pretty high rate, you might actually want Emrakul. You can get it off of the Vornclex um, chapter one trigger, but you could also just be like, cool, I did the milling and now I've got five different card types in there and this costs eight. And now mm. I can cast it and I get the cast trigger to and steal somebody's turn. And you'd much rather cast that one, definitely. Yeah, but it's still a 13-13 yeah. like, flample protection from... You no, know, it'll still get the job done. Yeah, it's still good to, to reanimate, or I keep saying reanimate, to bring out of the graveyard however Green does it. Yeah, it, it's not quite reanimate because they never they don't spend much time dead. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, speaking of gra- graveyard synergy, you are filling your graveyard a lot with that mill ability. So green is pretty good at sort of tutoring from graveyard. So there's Eternal Witness, Regrowth, Bolligan Recovery, Noxious Revival. Yeah. Noxious Revival could actually be used to put something on top of your library that you then oh, activate Warnclex floor. So that seems really good. Yeah, and, and of course these don't you know cheat on the mana of anything, but you already are going to want to be ramping like crazy in this deck just to be able to cast those things. So... Seems like a good little combo there. If you are worried about your graveyard and what's in there, I, I think people tend to worry about this too much, so this might not be necessary, but there are, Green has a bunch of cards that kind of shuffle your graveyard into your library. There's like Blessed Respite. Uh, mm-hmm. Endurance is a card that does it. Yep. Yeah. So you have access to that even without the Eldrazi Titan if that's something you want to do. And then, of course, let's talk about um, Proliferate here and the Saga Synergy. Power Conduit, Nesting Ground, still going to be good. Green has a card called uh, Weaver of Harmony, which is interesting. It's one in a green for a 2-2 two, two snake druid enchantment creature. Other enchantment creatures you control get plus one, plus one, but you can pay a green, tap the Weaver of Harmony, and target uh, or copy target activated or triggered ability you control from an enchantment source. And then you can choose new targets for the copy. So this is a way oh, that's cool. to go over chapter one hits. That's a triggered ability. You go, I'm going to copy that ability. I'm going to mill 20 cards and get four creatures back. That gets pretty well, solid. Yeah, it's 10 and then two and then 10 and then two again. But still, um, it made me realize we didn't talk about Strionic Resonator, which is... Oh, yeah, really good point. Works with Sagas. Um, so it could be viable for any of the, the Praetors that we've talked about. Yeah, Strionic Resonator does sometimes have the problem that it's a, like, a little win more if something is like already a big, powerful effect. But it's not that difficult to include in a deck anyway. It only costs two and two to activate. So it could be a nice include in almost any of these. Um, okay, and then of course, you know, green has some proliferate. It has Evolution Sage and some things like that. We, we're both kind of down on this this one. We think it's the least powerful a lot. I like to, in these instances, kind of see, is there anything we're missing? And I think, you know, as we were talking about in the office, I realized we're not talking about Chapter 2 at all. We're not talking yeah. about Chapter 3 at all. And for most of the other ones, Chapter 3 was like a thing worth mentioning. Chapter 2 is put 7 plus 1 plus 1 counters distributed among your stuff. You could maybe go in the direction of plus 1 plus 1 counter synergy stuff. Uh, Defiler of Vigor, Branching Evolution, Colonian Hydra... Um, uh-huh. Those are things that, you know, maybe if you built around the plus one, you know, maybe the chapter two matters to you. It's hard to figure out a way that chapter two becomes broken, though. Yeah. After paying 13 mana to get there. There are plenty of decks that do the plus one, plus one counter thing, and they can do it more efficiently than putting seven counters after, like, what was it, 13 mana that yeah. we said, and like two turns to right. deal with it. Yeah. Um. But the fight thing, I was like, well, is the fight thing interesting at all? Like, which once we get to chapter three, can we make that matter in some way? And there are fight-themed decks. There's, like, Faux Razor Regent that says, you know, whenever a creature you control fights, put two counters on it uh, at the beginning of the next end step. So uh-huh. that's a thing. And then I thought, oh, Enrage is pretty cool with fight-themed stuff. That's true. So, like, Polyraptor is uh, whenever Polyraptor... Uh, is dealt damage, create a token that's a copy of it. Or you've got a Vigor out. Vigor sure. Vigor's really good with it because instead of taking the damage, they just get bigger. Uh-huh. Uh, Rip Draw Raptors, an enraged card that draws you cards when it takes damage. Yeah, you could probably get two or three cards out of Rip Jaw Raptor. I really like Coffidon if you can figure out some tricky stuff with it because <laughs> yeah. when it takes damage, you untap target permanent. So it untaps the land that paid for the fighting. You might even be able, if you had like, you know, a Bounce Land or a Temple of the False God or something like that, you uh-huh. might be able to like gain mana through the Coffidon. Again, a Vigor or something's out and do some crazy stuff that way. There's also stuff that just makes you... Uh, 
doubles the size of your creatures. That's like a green effect they've added a lot recently. So unnatural growth and the uh, green dominus. Yeah. Uh, Sopen, Sopendril, however you say that. Zopendril? Yeah, that, that's probably right. They both say at the beginning of combat, you double the power and toughness of each creature you control until end of turn. Yeah. And this is usually good, but often they're like, okay, fine, I block. But in this case, you go, cool, go to combat. Everything gets twice as big. Declare my attacks before blocks. Fight, fight, fight. Yep. Kill all your stuff because my things are huge mm -hmm. and then kill you. So that's another way to go. I still think this is all adding up to like... It's it's a big it's a big green stompy deck. Yeah. And I don't think it's it's the best of the options for big green stompy decks. There's a lot of things out there that do the same kind of thing. And I also, I mean, I look at that amount of mana and like... At that point, it's like, why aren't you just casting a tooth and nail? Right. <laughs> the eight mana just to activate it. The 13 mana. Yeah. All told. Yeah. Just go and pick the two cards you want from your deck and play them in the thing. Maybe it's just so, you know, it's more fun and, and random as to what goes in the whole thing. But but it's not efficient in any yeah. way. Yeah. I think that's going to be the problem with the deck is just mm -hmm. eight to activate is so much. And it's still something you can whiff on, too. So it's the... The sort of chaos factor or the random factor of it, it I think, is going to hurt it. All right. So I, I think it's safe to say that you and I, we're both kind of a little bit down on Vorn Klex, right? Yeah. I don't even think it's all that close. Like, I think he's easily the least powerful. The least powerful of, of the five? I yeah. would agree with that. I think there's still some some fun stuff you might be able to do there, but yeah. I think it's just there's a large gap between Vorn Klex and the other four. I mean, if someone sits down with a, you know, a really nice Vorn Klex deck and they're like, this is going to get you, I'll be like, oh, I'm excited. But it can still do some powerful stuff, but I don't think it's probably, yeah. It's super not going to get the reaction that if they sit down with like almost any of the others. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Speaking of that, mm -hmm. of the remaining four, which do you think is the most powerful? Ooh, I mean, I'm a little torn because I really think Elish Norn and Jingataxius are like both going to be really powerful decks. But I, I have to say, I think Jingataxius edges it out because I think if you can get to the backside on Jingataxius, there's just no way you lose. Yeah, you just get that on omni one omniscience trigger. I mean, forget getting mul multiple flips in a turn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that seems nuts. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I think it's Jinja Taxis. I don't even think it's particularly close. I actually don't think I'd put Elish Norn second. I think it's Urbrask. Really? Probably, just because we know that Burgie Storm deck is very powerful. Yeah, that's true. Urbrask, when it's like put together, is going to just go... And, and you're going to lose. I think that Shieldred deck is actually would be quite powerful and maybe equally as powerful as Elish Norn, but I think it's the type of deck that's going to be annoying. It's not quite Turgrid or anything, but it's not going to be fun to play against, yeah. and I think people are not going to like it. I, I might have to see Shaildred in action before I entirely like believe that it's all that good, but it, it feels like it has a lot of potential. I mean, it's just going to be removal. It's yeah. gonna, removal is good. You can win a lot of games by just stopping your opponents. That's a great point. <laughs> Alright, to the listeners, what do you think of the new Praetors from March of the Machine? Are you planning on building any of them? Or are there any synergies, uh, combos, anything like that, that you think we missed yeah yep if there's anything like that let us know in the comments on twitter email etc uh, if you want to pick up any of the cards we just talked about uh, including the praetors themselves from march the machine or any of the old cards that go in the deck cardkingdom.com slash command is the place to go to get your magic products singles anything at all the great thing about card kingdom maybe the best thing about them is the fact that they are one retailer that has a ginormous inventory and therefore when you order your cards they all come in the same package at one time so if you want to build the jinga taxius deck from scratch you can make that list you can put it into your cart you can check out and you don't get like 50 packages arriving over the course of multiple weeks. You get one package that comes with all of your cards. You add the lands. Yeah, pop it open, sleeve yeah. it up. Oh, yeah. Don't forget to sleeve it up. <laughs> yeah. We're about to talk about Ultra Pro, but yeah, sleeve it up. <laughs> yeah, shuffle it up, and you're ready to go. That's what I love about it. Cardkingdom.com slash command. And of course, they also have sealed product draft boosters, collector boosters. If you want to try your hand, maybe get a serialized, serialized card or something like that, uh, you can get your collector's boosters at cardkingdom.com slash command. And of course, if you do the, get that serialized card, please protect it. Put it inside an ultra pro eclipse sleeve put that sleeve inside a satin tower deck box ultra pro.com slash command that's the place to go to get all of the ultra pro products and that is the company that jimmy myself most people at the command zone trust their own collections to yep. they really do make the best game accessories to protect your game pieces and not just protect them make them look awesome definitely they have the licensing IP with Wizards so that they can use the actual artwork from the game on their products so you can have a playmat 
sleeves, a deck box that all match or all match a theme. They don't all have to have the same image. P- playing like a game where your commander matches the playmat of the commander, that's a flex. It's like when you uh, walk into some place and you're dressed really nicely and just yeah. you feel that confidence. That's what it feels like when your playmat, deck box, and sleeves all match. So mm-hmm. ultrapro.com slash command, the place to go to get all of that. And then before we go, I just wanted to say one more thing. MagicCon Minneapolis is coming up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's May 5th through the 7th. We are going to be performing Game Nights Live again uh, on that uh, at that event. And if you haven't heard, we've announced the guests. It's going to be Graham and Kathleen from Loading Ready Run. And I got to say, they are returning guests from our most popular episode of Game Nights Ever. And Graham is going to be featuring the return of the Bear Force in... Uh, in that live episode or in that live performance. So if you're anywhere near Minneapolis or you just have the ability to come see us and hang out, please come see the show. And also, Jordan, you're going to be there. Jimmy's going to be there. Rachel's going to be there. Jake, Murph, Lady Danger. Many members of our team are going to be in Minneapolis for the entire weekend. So not just the Game Nights Live show. We're also yeah. going to be hanging out, playing games. Come play some magic with us. Well, I'm going to bring like all of my decks. <laughs> I won't bring quite all, but like six <laughs> or seven is about as many as I want to carry around. But yeah, we'll be there looking for games, taking photos meeting people. It's going to be great. Uh, There will be links in the show notes if you want to get tickets uh, or badges to that event. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Uh, Before we go, big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Damon Lenz, Arthur Middlecraft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Grav Galati, Jamie Block, Mitch Trafford, Evan Lindberger, Gabriel Pozos, Megan Yip, and Eric Lem. Okay. We'll see you uh, next time. We've still got some commanders to go for March of the Machines. Oh, yeah. uh, Some Phyrexianized stuff, including... My favorite commander from the whole set we still haven't talked about in all of the set oh. reviews. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you've been paying attention to the spoilers, you might know which one that is. You'll know which one it is. <laughs> all right. Thanks for watching. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>